So thank you for joining us for the webinar on how to integrate strategic foresight into your own organization. My name is Pira Tenorist. Uh, I'm the innovation lead at the OECD, and I work with the innovative governments and also uh, anticipatory and strategic foresight uh, approaches within uh, OECD member countries. Uh, today, we're going to look at the, the results of the work that we have to done together with the government of Flanders on how to actually integrate strategic foresight into your own government system. Uh, but first of all, what is strategic foresight? So in the simplest uh, definitions uh, that the OECD uses, in strategic foresight is the ability to constantly perceive, make sense of, and act on the future uh, in the present. So we are not doing strategic foresight to foresee the future. We are actually using strategic foresight for the benefit of making better decisions today. So the usual example that I like to use is, of course, from the field of weather forecasts. So at the moment, uh, this morning, uh, the weather forecast said that there is a mild chance of 70% chance of rain uh, at, uh, at, in Paris. So the act of really deciding on based on that knowledge is do we take an umbrella or not? So we use different strategic foresight products, be it from forecasting or be it from different scenarios to actually make better prepared decisions. And uh, today, to actually stress test, uh, integrate those innovative solutions, future-proofing our current actions today, because the changes we can actually make in our policies and organizations are usually uh, today in terms of the collective intelligence that we can use. So in brief, uh, strategic foresight really gives the benefit of uh, having kind of a structured, participatory, inclusive, impactful, uh, but also more systemic approach to actually looking at uh, future changes. Um, it deals with usually medium to long term future, but of course, when more the areas that you operate in and the organizations operate in might be very volatile. So, for example, in the field of artificial intelligence, we are not dealing with very medium long term futures. The medium term future uh, is essentially a matter of months. Uh, we could also see that during the COVID crisis, where strategic foresight, the usefulness of strategic foresight, uh, the prediction models usually were precise for a couple of weeks in terms of predicting how the pandemic was behaving. And after that, we had to already integrate in our policy making choices scenario approaches because the uncertainty levels were really, really high. So it really helps with priority setting and steering policies today towards a common or long-term of objectives or planning and strategy as, as well. So it helps to identify challenges and opportunities. It also helps to really invest in innovative solutions. So which types of innovations do we want to actually explore? Uh, as mentioned before, it really helps to also stress test current decisions, policies, approaches that your organizations are taking and also building or future-proofing uh, them for, for the future. And it also can really help uh, build shared visions and success stories as well. And there are a variety of methods and approaches and capabilities that might be necessary within your organization uh, to actually apply strategic foresight, to go from forecasting, from predicting, to actually anticipating, so imagining different types of the future and exploring those ideas in the future to make better decisions in practice. Uh, we at the OECD, so currently uh, our my colleague Peter from the Flemish government and a good partner, project partner, will tell you a little bit uh, more about what we have done in the government of Flanders. But the OECD is, we are currently also working on anticipatory good uh, practice principles. So how to actually build a governance system that will allow you to use strategic foresight in the most effective way. And here we are using and looking at the, the most uh, effective anticipatory government processes, so how, how to actually engage with uncertainty, um, how to ensure continuity across policy cycles, use of strategic foresight and transformative innovation, but also uh, dealing with um, effective approaches and capabilities to this in terms of leadership knowledge, capabilities of strategic foresight, intelligence, sense-making, governance structures, and coordination itself. So these are the things that we look at in practice. And in the government of Flanders, we have been working together uh, for over two years 
Uh, the work was already on the ground completed last year. We did first an assessment of the Flemish government uh, strategic foresight system, which is soon accessible for everybody also joining the webinar uh, in early June. And uh, then on, we actually created a blueprint for the government of Flanders uh, to how to embed strategic foresight uh, into this uh, system in a kind of multi-level perspective. And here I hand it over to Peter, who is working at the government of Flanders and is the director of strategic insights and analysis. And he will tell you a lot more about the blueprint itself and the great work the government of Flanders is doing in the context of strategic foresight. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Pirat and, and, and the team for having the opportunity to share with you some insights on embedding strategic foresight uh, within government. I will, um, let's see, I cannot share my screen. Um, okay. Yeah, now I can do that. No, uh, Julia, I, I cannot start sharing my screen. Can you open that up, please? Um, yes, uh, give me a second to draw up your slides. Um, Flo, any chance you have them available? So within my presentation, I want to share with you two elements. First, I will uh, give um, some information and some examples how we have been embedding uh, strategic foresight in our work. And then second, I will uh, highlight some of the elements of the blueprint uh, in a way we work together with the UCD to have a kind of a roadmap, uh, a blueprint. How can we learn from, from the assessment and how can we have uh, building blocks um, to improve our, our practice? I will try again. Yes, now I'm able to share my share my screen yes let's see so normally everybody should now uh, let's see my slides. So that's are the two topics that I want to share with you today. And I will first try, start to introduce ourselves. So we are working in the Chancellor and Foreign Office of the Government of Flanders. We have headquarters in Brussels, but we also have delegations all around the world. We have uh, many different responsibilities uh, linked with both the Foreign Office and the Chancellery. And one of, of an, uh, an important uh, responsibility is that we that we are engaged in providing evidence informed uh, policy making. And as part of that, we created a strategic foresight for resilience initiative. Um, we start working on that uh, during the COVID crisis. And it's quite normal that especially in times uh, that are very volatile, very uncertain, there's a lot of uh, complexity around that as government, we are seeking to create evidence to support our policy making. And what we learned during the crisis is that, of course, official statistics are important and are needed, but especially in times with uh, increased change, they are not, um, we need more to do that. And that's the, that has been the objective of the initiative to think how can we organize ourselves to create the anticipatory intelligence. Um, and foresight is an, is an, uh, ideal, um, an ideal lens or methodology or assembly of, of tools to do that. We haven't been doing that on our own. Uh, foresight by definition is all about um, crossing different boundaries, boundaries of time, and not only looking at the present, but keeping in mind what happened in the past and of course, having a long-term perspective uh, to the future for us. It's also um, crossing different policy domains 
and because we know that the challenges are uh, not coming in in nicely packaged uh, policy uh, policy domains. So foresight is an is a tool that helps policymakers to make the connections to understand how different trends and challenges are interlinked, and um, also that that the solutions um, have to be. Uh, interrelated and 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 and, and cross uh, different policy domains, and then uh, also important, it's uh, across different actors. Uh, as a government, um, we have uh, our responsibilities, but achieving our our goals, our objectives, serving society, we need to work with others. We cannot do that in our silo, and um, also within the initiative from in the beginning. We started to uh, work together with different actors in the Flemish government, but also outside, including people from academia, including from uh, EU institutions like the GRC, working together with um, promising uh, initiatives all around Europe, like Futures Platform, Tomorrowland, uh, working together with OPSI, um, and, and working together with the WRR. So, Foresight, by definition, helps you to understand challenges, uh, but also to look opportunities for collaborating with uh, different partners that can help you to achieve the anticipatory intelligence that is needed to address the current societal challenges. One thing what is important, especially in times of crisis, if you want to convince um, policymakers that um, it's not only time for action, but it's also time to invest in building up anticipatory intelligence. You need to be very clear and precise what is you're going to deliver. What functions are there that is providing an additional level of information, an additional level of support to, to policymaking? And to do that, we created together with the UCD, we created these four functions. And these four, four functions are not only providing uh, an answer to the challenges, but they are also very helpful to understand and the current practice and also to understand um, opportunities to improve the practice. So the four functions are discover. That's where it all starts. Um, but it's not a it's not an easy one, and it's not an, an obvious one, um, especially in times of crisis. How many people within government do still have the time to engage in discovery? And it has to do with trend and weak signals analysis, and you can you can add a different kind of uh, analysis uh, modes. But it's quite important, and sometimes uh, if you start to embed foresight within government. It's important to highlight that part of the of the activity um, is that you need time for discovery, that you need people who are skilled and have the mandate to uh, look for the trends, to look for the weak signals. So that's the first function. The second function builds on the first, and it's all about exploration. How can we make sense of all the insights that we learn from the discovery? And then initiatives and tools like horizon scanner scanning and and patterns and system analysis are in place but but especially in times of crisis it's also also an opportunity to engage with with the science community um, and science to policy dialogues can be a very effective means to get the insights get the intelligence into governmental uh, policy making so the second function, the explore, it's all about creating this anticipatory intelligence, not only building on dedicated tools like horizon scanning, but also engaging with science. And then the third step, the third function is the mapping function. All the intelligence that has been created is only the, the usefulness of the intelligence comes to the mapping. In a sense, the mapping allows you to then make the connections, make the link with current policy making and, um, and mapping the opportunities and challenges is a way to do that. 
So it has to do, for instance, with exportive, building exportive scenarios, tools like futures wheels, but also, and that's something that has been evolving the last, the last years, it's also um, mapping uh, resilient indicators in the sense that statistics are most often giving a, a status of, of the now. And the idea of resilient indicators is that you use your statistical data to get a better understanding on your future potential. So it has to do with capabilities, um, what are key functions in our society, in our government, and uh, what is the status of these key functions. And it has also to do in um, to map your weaknesses. Uh, we learned during the crisis that on certain areas, um, we were quite uh, resilient, but not overall. And um, these resilient indicators and working with them and using them also to support your policymaking is really helpful to prepare to be to, to better anticipate the next crisis to come. After the third function, uh, the discovery, the explore, and the map, then we come to the create. And the create is really all about impact and scale. So it's about creating visions, and so to, to, to really make use of all the insights and then to link it with a policy initiative. So it has to do with visions, with roadmaps, but also to do with coalitions for the future. Because we believe, especially in times of crisis, that governments need to work together, um, works together also with stakeholders to, uh, to ensure that um, even if sometimes it becomes really difficult, that we can work on recovery, but not only on recovery, but also work on, on resilience. So these four functions have been um, quite uh, effective for us to explain and to help uh, the collaboration within the government. Uh, and now we are also reaching out to collaborate and use the framework to collaborate with, uh, with other governments uh, from other regions or, or other uh, countries. I will continue with giving uh, two short uh, examples of the, of the functions. So the first example is the Explore. Um, in 2022, together with uh, FBO uh, Flanders, so the uh, research uh, fund, uh, and with the colleagues in the Netherlands, the WRR, we work together on uh, bringing scientists and policymakers among along uh, five teams together to understand the challenges, but also the opportunities, and then to provide leverage points to government uh, at the end of the day. So it was all about creating uh, and exchanging knowledge um, and allowing young researchers to participate and to engage in the science to policy. Um, as a government, it's not always easy to uh, publish your strategic foresight insights. And um, for each project, we always try to find a dedicated channel how to communicate our outcomes. And in this case, we used a Flemish journal for government management. Um, so there was a special issue where we, um, where we were able to bring all these insights together in different in different papers. A second example, it's a mapping example. It's an initiative that we uh, that we started last year. Um, so together with uh, ten other regions uh, in Europe, we built and explored scenarios for a resilient Europe. So we start uh, with analyzing different mega trends. From that, we build a scenario framework highlighting four uh, different uh, scenarios, smart optimism, hyper-competition, silver spheres, and urban flows. And we use these scenarios also in a way to, uh, to build up anticipatory intelligence. So we linked it uh, with horizon scanning using a digital platform. In this case, it was Futures Platform. It's a spin-off from, from, uh, from Finland. And um, by helping, by adding the horizon scanning, we created um, four uh, uh, underpinned scenarios. Then we worked together um, with uh, Tomorrow Lab to create 
for uh, video images from these scenarios. And we had, we organized several scenario workshops. The videos of the scenarios were uh, key to emerge the participants within these four different worlds. And then together with them, we explored not only uh, the challenges that are coming to, to us, but also the common ones. And that was really an important uh, part of the process. So Foresight allows you um, to link with different, with different governments, to learn how different challenges having an impact and um, what are the common challenges. And then by having an understanding of the common challenges, it was also enabling us to think how can we work together on finding uh, solutions to address these challenges and also how the group of regions can work together with, uh, with the EU. Uh, and so really having a multi-level a multi perspective in the, in the FOSA. I'm just looking at the time. How long do I have? Um, I guess I can still have five minutes. So you have one more minute, Peter. One more minute. Okay, then I will speed up a little bit. So based on these experience and based on the assessment uh, with, uh, with the UCD, uh, we worked together with them to create a blueprint. And it was really helpful getting all the, the insights from the UCD in there. And you can see you can what you can find in the in the blueprint um, that it gives an overview what are the key foundations if you want to have uh, foresight embedded within government. So it was based on a collaboration between the OECD and the government of Flanders, and um, it was informed by an OECD assessment of strategic foresight within the policy making system in Flanders. So in the blueprint, you can find the foundational elements and you can also find um, strategic drivers. And we hope that by having the blueprint, other governments can, 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 can use that uh, to get a better understanding on what they are uh, being using and what are opportunities to improve um, their own system, but also what are opportunities to reach out to other governments. Finally, uh, and that's my, my last slide, um, the blueprint and the assessment also allowed us to, to be more reflective on our practice, especially to, uh, to understand the enabling factors uh, for bringing a multi-level perspective within the foresight uh, work. And um, what you can see here is that um, for each of the activities and the output and tools, there are some principles behind. And that's a really important um, element of the foresight. Why are we doing foresight? What are the key principles? Um, and of course, it has to do with being future-proof, but also evidence-based, being more inclusive, um, having a focus on, on a systemic understanding, um, and in the end, uh, using the concept of resilience to, uh, to deal with crises. So an enabling factor there is to have a clear expectation management, um, including the principles, the activities, and the outputs. And not only before you start, but also uh, keep that in mind during and also after the foresight uh, process. To make all of these things happen, we also learned that it's important to have an assured, uh, to ensure a balanced internal external capacity it's okay if you have increased uh, initiative to, to work together and, and work together with academia or, or other initiatives, but at least um, for designing these projects and to, to really collaborate in these initiatives, it's important to have an internal capacity as well. What is still a major challenge is most often foresight is uh, based on, um, on, on, on a project uh, uh, initiative and we are we have been exploring also together with the ucd how can we move from a more project fragmented of an initiative to a more structural mandate for uh, doing foresight within cover that's all for me i hope um, with these insights i can contribute in into the debate how governments can embed foresight within their uh, policy making and thank you for your kind attention please feel 
feel free to contact us uh, for more information. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Peter. Uh, that was a, a lot of information to take in for everybody. Um, I believe we also have the blueprint uh, document to share. Uh, we'll do that in the chat in the chat in a moment. And I will hand it over to Indy now, who will be taking us through an interactive exercise to give all of you a chance to also contribute. Yes, thank you so much, Julia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's been really nice seeing some familiar names pop up. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to ask you to scan the QR code or uh, I will also send the link in the chat to this Mentimeter. Feel free to open it. I'll give you a couple of seconds for that. We're gonna go through three questions. It's basically on the implementation of the blueprint. Um, what kind of barriers you experience in strategic foresight right now? Uh, what kind of collaborations you see happening? And um, we're also gonna focus on a third question that is still a secret for now. Um, I hope everyone was able to yes, find the QR code. I see a lot of thumbs up coming in. So I'm guessing that is a good sign. I'm gonna to proceed to the first question. The biggest barriers for strategic foresight in your organization today, um, a word cloud will appear normally if everything goes well and then we can see what is going on in the world. Time. Silos in the workload, the budget. Short term thinking, still a thing. Overwhelm is also one we see a lot. Or training as well, capacity. Thank you so much for participating, everyone. I'm going to give us 20 more seconds on this one before we move on to the next one. It's quite interesting how time remains a very big one in the middle, together with resources, capacity, and understanding. Okay. Thank you for your contributions. We're going to go to the next question, which is um, Peter has just given you a bit of an introduction to the blueprint. Perhaps you've already had a chance of looking at it too. Um, we will share, of course, afterwards. We have a bit of trouble sharing it in the chat right now, so we will receive it via mail like this. Um, but what elements of the blueprint are most valuable for your implementation right now? What will you take home likely? This might be a bit of a harder question as well. Since we haven't had the opportunity to really look into it. Okay, so the four phases of foresight, the competences, the in-depth case analysis, mobilization as well, and methods and tools, of course. Stakeholder engagement as well. Yeah. This uh, fits the uh, barrier, the earlier barrier, really well with the buy in. Thank you so much for your responses again. I'm going to give us 20 more seconds on this one before we move on to the last one. Scenarios is one that popped up as well, as well as collaboration and anticipatory intelligence. Thank you so much. For the last question, whom would you or could you collaborate with in strategic foresight and how would this look like? What would this look like? 
or could be that you've already been doing this, could be that you're dreaming of a certain way, but there, there's still some barriers as well. Um, I would like you to think of this as if you have all the resources uh, needed. Young researchers as well, that's quite interesting. Opsy as well. Parliament, technology institutes, innovation labs. Citizens, quite an interesting one as well. You can see it twice here. Decision makers, yep. Seems like the blueprint is really hitting the spot when it comes to um, decision maker buy-in and stakeholder engagement. AI as well, of course. And experience facilitators, training institution, youth, creatives and artists, citizens. Okay. I'm going to give us 20 more seconds to round up here before I give the word back to Julia. Thank you so much for participating and thank you for your spontaneity. I know that it's a bit on the spot, um, but it's part of the exercise. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed the rest of our webinar today. Thanks very much, Indy, and uh, great insight from everybody here. Um, thank you for playing along with, uh, with the interactive exercise. Um, I'm now excited to um, introduce uh, the next item on our agenda, which is in uh, a panel with um, a distinguished group of foresight practitioners that have limited. Um, so there is a bit of a sound issue. Maybe we need to check in the room who has their 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 microphone on. Um, so uh, we have reached out to um, a certain number of our partners in different countries that are doing futures work in their own um, administrations and asked them to share some perspectives on the funders blueprint um, from sort of where they stand and how it relates to the work that they're um, driving in their countries. And we'll have um, different remarks from our panelists on sort of different um, aspects of the blueprint from ranging from the question of capacity building to evidence-based uh, policy making to uh, foresight as a way for transformative policy or transformative um, action more broadly. Before we dive in and I'll hand it over to panelists, um, Flo, just handing it over to you to introduce the round of speakers that we've brought together here today. Thank you, Julia. Uh, also from my side, a warm welcome to everyone. And indeed, I have the honor to introduce our esteemed panelists to you today. Um, some of the surnames are quite challenging, so I will stick to the first names if that is all right. Uh, so let's dive in. Beginning with Sigita, uh, Sigita serves as uh, a policy analyst at the European Commission, specializing in strategic foresight. And with prior experience in the Lithuanian government, she brings valuable insights into fostering or building strategic foresight skills and capabilities, both at government and at the European Commission. Next, we have uh, Thea. Uh, she's the head of the Foresight Center at the Estonian Parliament, which conducts foresight projects on various topics. And with this experience, Thea will shed light on the nexus between strategic foresight and um, evidence-informed policymaking. Then joining us as well is Mati. Uh, he works at the Ministry of Finance uh, in Finland in a team focusing on governance. And from his experience, he will share insights on integrating strategic foresight into government processes. And then we also have Louis, uh, who is the foresight lead at Nesta, which is a UK-based innovation agency that designs, tests, and scales new solutions to social challenges. And he will discuss linking strategic foresight to transformative innovation. And last but not least, uh, we have Robert, and he is the head of sustainable development at the Welsh government, working on sustainable futures and he will provide an overview of strategic foresight across the policy cycle uh, with Wales as uh, an example. 
So, uh, Julia, I now pass the floor back to you um, to kick off the presentations of our esteemed panelists. Thank you so much, Flo. Uh, and with that, no uh, further words, but I'm just wanting to hand it over to Sikita to let us know um, how you look at the blueprint from the JRC's perspective. Thank you. I hope uh, I can see my presentation yeah, as I speak. Your presentation will so, be yes, uh, dear colleagues, it's both my pleasure and honor to be here today and share some of my experience of actually uh, introducing strategic foresight into the organization. And uh, today uh, I'm representing the EU Policy Lab, but I the major lessons uh, learned that I want to share with you today come from my previous experience, actually, as a project leader for National Long-Term Strategy Lithuania 2050. And strategic foresight uh, was used as one of the main approaches in preparation of it. So maybe you will see some relations to the Belgian Flanders uh, blueprint. So using the opportunity, uh, I'd also like to present uh, uh, the shortly the EU Policy Lab, in case you don't know it. Uh, we are a lab, a space and a mindset, a collaborative and experimental space for innovative policymaking. We engage in cross-disciplinary exploration and develop new insights in policymaking by applying uh, collaborative and uh, systemic and forward-looking approaches. You're a bit uh, further than uh, I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so that's the, the challenges of uh, of working in hybrid ways. So yes, uh, as I mentioned, we are a policy lab uh, that uh, we apply collaborative, systemic and forward-looking approaches to help bringing the scientific knowledge into the EU policymaking as we're part of the Joint Research Center, which provides independent evidence-based knowledge and science supporting the EU policies. About a year ago, I completed my duties uh, in the project Lithuania 2050. We started back in uh, 2020 as an exploratory exercise of 50 experts, next slide please, from various fields trying to evaluate uh, the relevance and potential impact of 14 megatrends elaborated by GRC on the future of the country. Here you see a combination of the all discussion groups, uh, of all the discussion groups, uh, which to me resembles the idea of trying to make sense uh, out of uh, chaos ended, and that ended with a vision document approved last December by 81 votes from MPs representing all parliamentary groups. And currently, uh, please share the next slide, uh, uh, governance for future, still next, ecosystem is evolving in Lithuania. OECD is involved in a special project here as it is also collaborating with Flanders. So my key lessons from Lithuania 2050. Next slide, please. Still next. Uh, yeah, thank you. So first lesson. Uh, in the beginning, there was well, as you mature, follow the ecosystems approach and don't take it just another brick in the wall. Let me expand a little bit on each of them. So the next slide. Wayne Gretzky, the Canadian ice hockey player, considered by many to be the greatest player in the history of NHL, famously said, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. Perhaps this phrase is actually overused by now, but I heard it from the first time from our former former Prime Minister Bishala on the day we presented ourselves as Strata to the wider audience. Strata means Government Strategic Analysis Center, where I used to work at that time. To me, it grasps the idea, the essence of the strategy and foresight that is about being able to see and use the opportunities evolving in order to take a better position, make better decisions for the future. Uh, and that relates similarly to what Pirit has told you uh, in the beginning of this webinar. There is already some uh, knowledge to build on, although we don't have yet any facts about the future. Therefore, scanning the environment, making sense of how certain trends and weak signals could develop and trying to foresee the best possible futures for action enables you to take, pro to take proactive position and helps to create the future you want. And we wanted to master those skills. Learn by doing. That was a precious advice I was given at the time we started by the senior expert on foresight, Laurent Bontou, who happens now to be my colleague here in the policy lab. And that's what we actually did. We collected a small group of people who either had some will to learn foresight by doing or had some previous knowledge about it, and we were willing to contribute to the project. Next slide, please. Many more joined us on the way as it was a long journey, as you can see. But Flanders, as we heard today, is not starting from the scratch. You are here. Uh, we heard the presentation of the colleague uh, Peter De Smit, and I can tell you even that uh, here in the policy lab, I share the office with an experienced foresight, Yannick Dujardin, who also comes from Flanders. 
So I think it's important when you uh, see uh, some initial uh, results of, of your initial first steps, it's important to think of ways how to institutionalize uh, 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 the efforts. And that's similar to what Peter has said, in order not to make it just a one shot or one project exercise. So it, it's really important to think in broad terms. Uh, for instance, here you see what the School of International Futures suggests as an approach. Think about your sociocultural context, your governmental context, what are your capabilities, and how could you develop into ecosystem. I like the focus on the people, as most often you have to rely on them in the initial phases as champions, but then it's important to link foresight to all uh, stages and broader processes and structures of decision making. And then try to avoid to look at the foresight as yet another brick in the wall as suggest the authors of the recent paper from the European University Institute. They say that as governments and organizations develop their foresight functions, there is a risk of seeing foresight just as a set of tools and guidance or as an extra administrative step. step. Instead, the transformational power of foresight lies in challenging conventional thinking and assumptions at all stages of policy making. To enable a culture of anticipation, organizations should embed foresight as a practice throughout the policy cycle, and in so doing, it is important to ensure inclusive and appropriate participation of multiple actors and stakeholders. What I would add, foresight enables you not only to see analytical, to use analytical instruments and data, but also your imagination. And if you are interested in learning more about this, I invite you to follow us in the EU Policy Lab together with, with my colleague, Eric Kabol. We are just starting uh, a project future-oriented policy making with the aim of creating tools and capacity building for capacity building of the member states' public administrations for future-oriented policy making. It will be open to policymakers at the national, regional, and local levels. I hope to see at least some of you there. And I'm looking forward to our future discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sigita. Great insights um, and also some uh, room for collaboration with people that are attending today. Um, so I hope that this will be useful for some of you. Um, we do have quite a, an ambitious timing. Um, so I'm going to immediately hand it over to Mati from Finland, who will talk to us a little bit about um, what it takes to build up a proactive government in practice. Um, and what that looks like in Finland. Over to you, Mati, and I believe your presentation is ready. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so my name is Matti Kuivalainen, and as uh, Julia told you, I work for the Ministry of Finance of Finland, uh, the Public Governance Department. Previously, I worked for the Prime Minister's Office and its Strategic Foresight Team, and I, I've also experienced with uh, the government's strate uh, strategic, um, strategic work and uh, implementation of a uh, government program. So uh, this picture of the uh, multiple strategic foresight assets that we have in Finland is actually based on an OECD assessment of Finnish uh, systems uh, uh, capacity on ancillary uh, governance. And as you can see, we have many elements uh, to support uh, ancillary uh, governance in Finland. There's a committee for the future uh, in the national parliament there's a strategic foresight team in the Prime Minister's office, which prepares the report on future uh, to be uh, uh, handled uh, in the committee for the future. We have CITRA, uh, which produces uh, megatrend reports, participates in national dialogues, uh, where also our ministry and our team uh, is also active. This national dialogues is a way to uh, uh, have uh, citizen participation embedded into uh, strategic foresight. Uh, the sectoral ministries have strategy and research units, teams, directors uh, in the ministries, and uh, government agencies have innovation labs, uh, which combine strategic foresight, innovation activities, and inform their um, organization's uh, strategy work uh, based on the uh, public sector innovation activities that they are taking. We have a lot of uh, networks uh, where uh, foresight and innovation practitioners uh, come together and share insights and uh, uh, maybe envision uh, future uh, projects together. And of, of course, uh, we have a future research center and also many sectoral research institutes are responsible, for example, foresight uh, on technology, foresight on the future of uh, health and well-being and et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of strategic foresight assets, but as the OECD did the assessment on the Finnish uh, uh, capacity for anti-battery governance, they uh, noticed that there's an impact gap 
from all these strategic foresight activities uh, into the very core government processes, uh, public sector innovation, uh, strategic work within the ministries, etc. So can you please uh, change the slide? Uh, so uh, what I think uh, what we need uh, uh, to develop further is this kind of uh, uh, integrating of anticipation into everyday policy cycles. So uh, here the thing can start uh, with this strategic foresight, uh, which kind of informs uh, politicians or the CEOs of uh, various government agencies. And what is very important is to have this kind of ancillary dialogue between uh, strategic foresight specialists, uh, uh, policy makers, uh, civil servants, and the decision makers. So this way you are able to kind of inform uh, the strategic decision making, which in the end gives you mandate, whether it's kind of political or mandated in the strategy of your given organization. And um, uh, if done correctly, I believe uh, that uh, this kind of uh, policy thinking uh, leads to more policy coherence, uh, which is uh, reflected in the budgeting decisions, uh, in the management, uh, this uh, means performance management, uh, HR, things like that. And in the end, it leads to uh, more uh, effect, uh, impactful uh, and effective innovation activities. So actual innovations that have been implemented are, and are creating value uh, to the citizens. <clears throat> and here, uh, the innovation uh, is in the end of the cycle, but obviously we also need innovation in the, in the systems level. So this is just in the, like simple policy cycle to kind of maybe inspire you. But of course, every country has to uh, adapt uh, this kind of uh, think in the building of ancillary governance in their national context. So this is just one way of visualizing uh, how it could be done and what kind of elements you have to uh, take into consideration if you want to integrate strategic foresight into the very core government, government processes of strategy, uh, drafting, budgeting, management, and eventually into innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mati, for giving a super brief insight into a very uh, uh, complex and uh, well-developed system of Finland. Um, and we're staying geographically very close, moving from Helsinki only over to Tallinn. Um, over to you, um, Tia, uh, to tell us a little bit about um, evidence-informed policy making and how strategic foresight can be playing a role in that. And we're going to pin you because you don't have any slides. There we go. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, for the kind uh, introduction. I'm glad to see quite many familiar faces among the panelists. Uh, great, great to meet you again. And uh, um, the topic uh, I was given today about strategic foresight in evidence-informed policy making, I can highlight um, in, uh, in the context of how we work with the Estonian uh, parliament to get our messages through there. So uh, the role of uh, foresight center in Estonia is, is to inform the wider public and as we are linked to the parliament, uh, we, we consider them to be our main target group to inform the parliament and the wider public about the alternative scenarios, future risks and opportunities. And uh, we've covered quite many topics already throughout our six years of existence. And uh, I put a link uh, to the chat when you can um, uh, receive more information about uh, the topics that we've covered and should you be interested in some of them in particular you can contact me later on. So we work topic wise two to three different topics each year and uh, we call the parliament members um, uh, to uh, propose topics that they consider to be important and actual uh, to be tackled with uh, foresight methods and uh, perhaps to work on alternative scenarios uh, so that our work plan, our pipeline would reflect as in a, in a best way uh, the, uh, the wishes uh, of, the, of the parliament members of the political factions represented in the parliament. Uh, so um, uh, we consider 
the informed info, informing of the policy making to be done if the parliament members take on our messages meaning that they start to convey them by themselves they start to represent the messages that we've uh, worked out uh, our insights and um, of course this is not uh, the end of the policy making process but this is already a strong input to the ministries uh, who uh, um, work daily with, with different issues. If the parliament members start debating publicly that these are the risks and opportunities brought out by the Foresight Centre that we should tackle rather sooner than later, this is the impact. This is how we see our impact to the policy design landscape. So the ministries um, are then um, starting to to react to the messages and inform the public when and how they are going to tackle this. So um, uh, another link is that we involve ministries directly too as we uh, compile steering committees for each of our topics that we work on and we involve both the interested parliament members and also representatives from the ministries to the steering committee. So this is another channel to convey the messages to the ministries and perhaps uh, trigger some responses uh, from them. And uh, what is important to my mind is that we use media proactively to amplify both links. So we really um, try to be um, very Mm, uh, active in media so that uh, uh, when we, we have important messages uh, uh, at hand, uh, we would like to, uh, we work with journalists to get articles, news pieces out of them. So whenever the MPs read from media about our insight or, or our message, they take uh, they tend to take the message much more seriously so this is how it works and we consciously use this option uh, to to uh, roll uh, uh, our messages through media uh, as an amplifier to get to the mps and uh, also uh, some lessons another lesson that i could quickly bring that we've learned is that um, uh, in order to make the mp interested in you and your message you need to bring some numbers so we consciously again combine uh, the foresight methods with some more traditional analysis methods uh, to provide numbers um, as i uh, took from the presentation of peters that um, uh, the idea of using resilience indicators, but we go even further and we try to do some hypothetical uh, simulations, uh, whether they are then back on the envelope type of calculations or they are more, uh, more uh, data based uh, uh, tools and uh, even forecast models sometimes that we use to simulate different hypotheses. What if this phenomenon grows to that extent? What would it mean? And if you want to really engage um, parliament members to evoke them, uh, them in their interest, then uh, talking, budget, talking of budgetary impact is uh, the uh, most uh, instrumental hook that we can uh, that, that we've learned uh, that we can use. So uh, whenever there is. Uh, a phenomenon that we uh, that we study trend wise so we try to do simulations calculations that what if this grows to that extent for example uh, uh, the share of self-employed and the share of gig work or platform work in estonian economy what would it mean budget wise for example to tax revenues so these kind of calculations we consciously use uh, we build them up and we use them to get the MPs interested. So uh, the lesson, two lessons. One is work closely with media to get them the, your messages through, and then they are then backlashed to um, to the MPs and to the to the uh, ministry personnel. And the other other uh, insight uh, I would like to um, to point out is uh, that um, uh, use numbers. Mm try to uh, come up with some numbers, even if they are, are hypothetical and based on different assumptions. Of course, be very clear of your assumptions that you've used, but use numbers. And in, in that way, you can um, give them the practical piece of information that they, in turn, can build their own um, 
talking points upon and their own highlights uh, kind of they can use it as a as a as a brick in their uh, uh, in their message building uh, by themselves so very quickly these were, were the two main uh, insights i wanted to share with you thank you Thank you so much, Tia. Very rich uh, insights into the Estonian way, both in terms of who you work with, uh, the type of communities you engage, um, how you uh, purvey messages, how you bring uh, futures across from a communication perspective, um, and also where it sort of sits within uh, policy decisions. Um, we're now moving, um, I just looked it up, around 3,000 kilometers um, southwest um, over to Wales. Um, and before I hand it over to you, Rob, um, just also letting um, participants know that you're very welcome to post your questions for panelists in the chat. Just make sure that you um, say who you want to address. It can be um, more than one person, obviously. Um, and with that, I'm handing it over to Rob to tell us something about the perspective of the Wales Futures Commission. Um, and how um, sustainable futures and strategic foresight feed into evidence-informed decision-making in Wales. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Julia. Uh, Prananda, good afternoon. Uh, let me start by thanking the organisers for putting together this event. Uh, I think it's a really important theme that we're exploring, um, and I also think it's quite a timely session, um, given the UN Summit of the Future that will be happening in September. And if we look at the draft documents that are currently in circulation, they are referring to uh, the importance of foresight. Um, so I think it's important we use this momentum and you know, I'm, I'm gonna be providing a bit of insight into the case study of Wales. Um, so I work within Welsh government. It's one of the devolved administrations within the UK. Uh, Wales has quite a unique approach to futures and foresight because this work stems from a piece of legislation, uh, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act that some of you may have heard of. That was passed in 2015, and it created a number of things, uh, including national well-being goals, um, legal duties, an independent future generations commissioner. But also importantly for, for this purpose, uh, it created a duty on Welsh ministers to publish a future trends report. And it defined long term as one of the five ways of working, which we consider within Wales uh, essential to sustainability. So together, the Future Trends Report and the long-term way of working give us legislative mechanisms through which to undertake long-term planning, futures foresight. So that's that's quite unique in Wales. If we can move to the next slide. Um, and, and apologies, I appreciate there's quite a lot of information on this slide. If, if you use the pop-out function at the top right-hand side of the screen, uh, that should help if you're struggling to read any of that. This is just a quick overview of the kind of information that the Future Trends Report uh, includes. So there's an infographic uh, that provides an at-a-glance overview, a narrative summary, which gives you the kind of story of what's happening, and an evidence pack. I think there's a basic insight here, which is that you have to curate your foresight products for different audiences. So some people are more persuaded by visual outputs, others by graphs, projections, or like Teo was just mentioning, you know, figures and costs, others by, you know, stories of what may happen in the future. On the left-hand side of the screen, I've taken a trend from the evidence pack to quickly demonstrate how we actually do some of this work in practice. So you'll hopefully be able to see uh, the government's projection there, which shows that uh, in 20 years' time, there will be around 20% more single-person households in Wales than today. So this is a conversation starter. This trend uh, gets users to think about the potential implications of this uh, on things like community cohesion, on health, housing requirements, sustainability, transport use, for example. It's not about, as has been already said, it's not about accurate predictions. It's about making better decisions today questioning our assumptions today, and sometimes using trends that aren't necessarily at the forefront of people's thinking. In terms of integrating foresight into an organization, what we've done in Welsh government is we've looked at the systems and processes that we have and looked for kind of logical entry points uh, through which we can encourage colleagues to look to the longer term. So a few examples, um, it's a central part of our uh, impact assessment process 
when money is public money is spent in Wales, it goes through our procurement and grants processes, and they include an appraisal of how long term has been taken into account. It's part of our corporate learning and development offer. So training is provided to all civil servants uh, in Wales. Every region in Wales produces their own place specific plan, which addresses uh, you know, the kind of likely future trends within their areas. We have a very small dedicated team within Welsh Government that also acts as a kind of go-to hub for advice. And really our aim is about empowering others to explore foresight tools and using that as part of their policy making. So rather than us going in and doing that work for them, we are providing them with the tools and methods to do it for themselves. And I think that's an important point as well. One of the questions I often get asked is, you have this legislation, give me an example of you know, where you are seeing tangible changes. And I would say that increasingly, uh, key government strategies, key Welsh government strategies are shifting their focus to the longer term picture. So for example, our transport strategy, our national development framework, our national waste strategy, uh, our national milestones, all of these things have been developed with a longer term lens, looking at that 2040, 2050 horizon. More recently, uh, we commissioned a piece of research, Foresight for Sustainable Development and Wellbeing Governance in Wales, which was written by Dr. Laura De Vito, who also co-authored uh, the Another Brick in the War paper uh, with Professor Claudio Radaieli at EUI uh, that Sagita mentioned earlier. This goes back to the point as well that, that Peter was making about making full use of that science policy interface uh, within this work. One of the recommendations that came out of that report was the importance of harnessing uh, your networks to maximize influence and impact. So as a result of that, we are in the process of developing a Wales Futures Hub uh, across the Welsh Public Service in collaboration with the Future Generations Commissioner's Office and also, among others, uh, counterparts in Nesta based in Wales. And that is really about pooling resources, bringing in more diverse perspectives and constructive challenge. So I'm conscious of time, um, but I would say in summary, there are sort of five insights, key insights from me. So first of all, tailoring your work uh, to different audiences, going beyond simply publishing reports and, and having a more hands-on approach, framing foresight as a tool for better decision-making, not accurate predictions, looking for logical entry points within your organizations, within your policy-making to integrate foresight further, and then using your networks effectively. So not just academia, thinking about other countries, organizations like the OECD. And, you know, the Welsh government, for example, has a memorandum of understanding with the Flemish government. So, you know, that's, that's an example. And, and we look forward to continuing that dialogue and, uh, you know, uh, interested in any feedback or comments you might have. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that there's a lot of sort of round circles that we're hearing here where um, some of the insights are similar from different regions. There's already existing collaborations between, um, well, Wales and, and Flanders. Um, and this is, of course, something that there's a lot of interest to um, expand further on it. Um, but also in terms of some of the learnings that we've had um, and how to communicate futures um, and how to make sure that the message is coming across and really used for decision making, not just sort of a nice to have conversation. Um, and I'm really happy to now um, hand it over to our uh, last but not least, as we've already heard, uh, panelist um, uh, Louis from, from Nesta. We already heard that you're doing some work in Wales, but I'm really keen to hear a bit more broadly um, about how strategic foresight is informing uh, transformative innovation and how you support your partners um, in making that happen at Nesta. Over to you. Thanks, Julia. Yes, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Louis Steffel harris I'm Foresight Engagement Lead at Nesta, which is the UK's innovation agency for social good. I'm going to be rattling through quite a few different projects here, so I'm just going to post all of the links in the chat now, so you can click on those and have a little look at them while I'm speaking or later. So yes, I'm going to be talking about how we use strategic foresight to inform transformative innovation at Nesta. So we're a charity that's existed for around 20 years, set up by the government. 
Um, and we've got three big missions in education, health and sustainability with targets for 2030. So we want to narrow the outcome gap between children growing up in disadvantage and the national average. We want to increase the average number of healthy years lived in the UK, particularly for those affected by health inequalities. And we want to accelerate the decarbonisation of the UK's homes. We combine different innovation methods to achieve those moonshot goals. And my team, the discovery team, is our foresight and futures team. We're embedded in Nesta's strategy department, and we're designed to help our colleagues think beyond 2030 and anticipate changes in technology and society to integrate that learning into their strategies. So we support teams in a ton of different ways, and I'm gonna just go through some of those we do horizon scanning, which makes it easier for Nesta's leaders to understand the impact of emerging technology and social change to strengthen our strategy. Some examples of that are our Future Signals series, um, which is an annual series of articles exploring the things we think might be coming up in the next year. Uh, this year, we're thinking about neuro privacy and how artists can poison their work against AI. We also worked on Minister for the Future, which was an essay series exploring long-term policy ideas like a national health bank to invest in preventative medicine. Next up, we stress test ideas and answer big questions for our mission colleagues. So things like how will people pay to heat their homes in 15 years time, which uh, was a project where we found five really promising business models, which our mission team colleagues are now exploring. We've also explored what we can learn from innovative international policies on obesity, finding several examples, including the Metabo law in Japan, where employers are required to measure the waistlines of their employees. We also develop novel approaches, approaches in foresight, blending different methodologies together from traditional foresight techniques to data science, qualitative research and design to bring in those new insights. For example, our Innovation Sweet Spots program brings together foresight techniques with open data sets on things like venture capital and grant funding, public discourse, news media and policy discussions to track the trajectory of technologies. We also do quite a lot of speculating and prototyping. So um, we've recently did a project exploring how generative AI could be used in early years education. We created three prototypes, including an activity generator that allows you to type in the interests of a child and also say what kind of activity you'd like. And it goes away, looks at the early years curriculum in the UK and generates activities that are suitable for that age group. We are also exploring what we could do with the UK's gas grid when we don't need it anymore for household heating. Uh, my favourite idea of a soup tap in every home might not be practical, but I'm really pushing for that one. Um, and we've also been exploring whether synthetic biology could help us tackle climate change. The next thing we do is that we expose our staff to new ideas. We bring in different perspectives and practices from outside the organization to inspire Nesta staff and challenge their assumptions. So we organized a discovery month on generative AI, bringing in guest speakers to, to kind of train our staff on how to use these tools over five weeks. And we also organize residencies of experts in our mission sectors who come in and work with us for weeks or months um, to tell us what their working world is like. So for example, we've had a heat pump installer come and work with our sustainability team. And finally, we create space for exploration. So we design programs that give staff time and resources to undertake more experimental and self-directed work than they would otherwise be able to do. So we run sabbaticals, which allow our colleagues to go and spend between one and three months in another organization, learn a ton of stuff and bring that back to Nesta. And we also organize things like Explorations Week, where everybody takes a week off from their normal job to explore a new topic or a way of approaching their work. So we use the tools of strategic foresight that we've been talking about throughout this webinar to varying degrees in all of those different activities, and we embed it into as many different projects and processes as we can. And we're seeing the benefits. Our team has existed for three years, and our colleagues are more confident dealing with uncertainty, bolder in their ideas, and more comfortable with failure than when we started. So that was a very quick whistle-stop tour. So I'll, I've, I've posted the links in the chat, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a, a really interesting um, 
mix of topics from waistline measurement to child activities. And I think we are all going to go back and talk to our employers about uh, Exploration Week, right, is what it was called. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I was very pleased to see that there's already um, an exchange happening. Um, and we have some questions coming in. I think the panelists are already getting back to um, the, the audience asking those. Um, but I'll hand it over to Flo to also do this uh, for everybody's benefit. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, um, and I see that there's um, quite some interest uh, coming in. So Flo is going to just uh, talk us through a few of the things people are wondering about and uh, asking our wonderful panel that I'm really, really impressed with. Um, to give us their take on things. Okay, thank you, Julia. Um, also, from my side, a big thank you uh, to everyone, to our uh, experts. I heard some interesting examples and perspectives, and I can imagine that there are a couple of questions from the audience for, for our experts. Um, we have a bit more than five minutes, I guess to take uh, a couple of questions, maybe starting with a question for Sigita uh, from Roman. Um, Roman, he wonders, or he writes, you mentioned the importance of harnessing your networks and the Wales Initiative, the Wales Futures Hub. I was wondering how you facilitate all these perspectives and what the hub would be mostly used for in terms of level of niche or expertise. And following that, do you feel like this initiative is scalable? Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, so what I would say is that we're at a very early stage of development of the hub. So in, in Welsh, it would be hub to foddol. Um, the, really, the idea of it was to bring together a coalition of officials who have exp expertise across the public service in things like environment, health, equalities, you know, government policy making, and use the group to kind of challenge ideas, um, provide assurance on projects, work collaboratively, um, encourage one another, because sometimes, you know, these teams are small and it, it, some of these tasks are quite big. So that was the kind of aim to maximize our investment. Um, I, I think the other, the other point is obviously the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act requires us to, to follow a principle of involvement. So again, this, this really meets that requirement. I think there are lots of different perspectives and views and people place more value on certain things than others. I don't think that's been necessarily a challenge um, at this stage, given the sort of size of our group. Um, that is more of an opportunity, really, um, that you know we can get insight on things that perhaps we're not so familiar with. It is a small group. That means that we are able to be agile and we are able to you know work at pace and and kind of look at things that uh, you know from, from from a perspective of a of a small group. So I, th I think there are some elements that would be scalable. Um, I think if it, if the group were to become, you know, bigger, I think that, you know it risks, uh, you know, that there are risks with that that you lose the kind of essence of of, of what a small, you know, uh, fast paced group would would look like. But um, I definitely think you know this is a sensible thing that other uh, organisations or other public services across the world could be looking at if you're all doing the same thing it makes sense to join up and kind of maximize your potential um, particularly at the moment in the uk in the context of you know financial constraint it, it makes sense to do that thank you so much uh my apologies rob <laughs> for mixing up the names but the next question uh will be for sigita uh and is the following uh, could you elaborate a bit on the ecosystems approach so what is the rationale and goal and what principles does it follow and please try to be very brief thank you yes uh, i already put uh, a, link, uh, a link to the report in the chat uh, to make it very brief uh, so i only would suggest uh, that to think in the ecosystems as the uh, authors uh, suggest to think in terms of the supply and demand so that this healthy ecosystem really nurtures itself then in the end and then not try to, to focus on building on one super team which is brilliant in, in providing strategic foresight but really to think in a broader terms and they suggest to, to think in terms of culture and behavior processes structures and people and from my own experience i would say that perhaps the easiest thing is to make some legal changes and amendments but uh, maybe the most uh, difficult part of it is 
changing the culture and the behavior. So that would be in short, but I hope you read the report if you're interested. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I saw also some general questions from Angus. Um, it's a question directed to everyone on the panel. Um, and he is wondering if there is a comprehensive guideline available for good foresight um, approach, uh, as there are quite a lot of uh, literature available online. Um, so who would like to uh, provide an answer to this question, which is quite broad? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on this one. Okay, perfectly. Um, yeah, great question, Angus. I, I, I would go for quality over quantity. So um, it really is about picking the tools and methods that work for the question and the style of investigation that you're actually using. Um, one thing I use as a, a bit of a Bible is um, the UK government has a government office for science and they have produced a futures thinking and foresight uh, toolkit. Um, and that actually has several journeys in there pathways, they call them, which allow you to use a number of different tools um, in order and get a logical outcome from that. So, for example, if you want to determine a vision for a new policy area or you want to explore underlying issues or causes when scoping and, and defining an area of work, um, it can be really useful for that. But there's no minimum number. Five, you know, sounds like a lovely number to use, but you could be doing one activity and find a huge amount of, uh, of resource and value out of that. Um, so that, that's how I'd answer your first question. In terms of your second question about introducing the concept of futures thinking to your organization, I think the most important thing is to get them involved in some of the tools. Um, even if you're doing it on a topic which is kind of made up for the purposes of, of getting them involved in something, just get them involved in using these tools um, and get them to reflect on how they might be useful in their everyday work so that you can start to demonstrate the value of thinking outside the box and thinking a bit more in a, in a futures focused way. I hope that's helpful. I hope I can also add a little bit. Uh, so I mentioned the uh project we are starting here in the policy lab. So I hope that uh, as one of the outcome of, of it will be a toolkit also providing some guidance on the most important tools, as well as some pre-designed pathways of really how to embed foresight into your particular policymaking context. So I hope that will be useful. Just follow the news. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see one more question, I think, from Maya, and it's a question to Robert. With a longer term strategy, how Wales, uh, how the government of Wales links the strategy and specific policy and projects, and how it manages the progress so as not to make it just a set of ambition? Robert. I think that's a really good point because. Um, the temptation with longer term strategies, if we're talking 2040, 2050, is that people are inclined to be ambitious because they might not be directly implicated in delivering on that or they might not be around at that point. So I think what's really important in these delivery, you know, in, in, in the delivery of these plans and their implementation is that you have key milestones along the way. So set sensible, uh, you know, times within which you need to have achieved a certain aim. Um, and I think that's, you know, across the, across the board in terms of Welsh government policies, that's the approach. Um, so I, I would I'd say that's an important thing. Um, and so sorry, was there a second question in there? Was that was that the yeah okay? The second question was how um, how it manages the progress so as not to make it just a set of ambition. Yeah, I I think so. You know, alongside milestones, I think. It's about having discussions with people as well. So, you know, it's important to have governance around longer term plans, um, particularly if they're, if they're ambitious longer term. So I would say things like uh, project boards, groups that meet regularly to discuss uh, the, the progress in itself is, is useful. Um, you know, and, and, and also being flexible about plans as well, because obviously things are changing, the, the, the pace of change is, you know, widely seen as accelerating. So, you know, also being having that flexibility and, you know, being able to, you know, have that ability to change uh, things with, you know, if, if the conditions demand that. 
Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I don't see any questions left. Um, and yeah, we are also running out of time. So maybe we can conclude here and wrap up. Um, Coming in, um, there's a question that uh, Mati already um, typed an answer to in the chat, but it, I think it might be something that might be uh, beneficial to everyone. It was a question about how you measure the impact of strategic foresight, which is always the million dollar question and not easy to answer. Um, so I thought that might be something um, we can also get the panel to come in on. Uh, Mati, of course, you, but um, anybody else as well. Tia. Well, I don't, of course, want to rob might be uh, the, the right uh, answer, the uh, chance to present the right answer. However, I would like to um, uh, perhaps uh, from our experience uh, to, uh, to share how we've uh, interpreted when we have had an impact on the policy making and uh, and uh, definitely that's no clear cut. This is the first message. This is no clear cut. And uh, um, what you can actually measure and track is how the message has spread uh, among the, the policy designers, for example, among the public discussion uh, to the, the, the people uh, actively discuss, uh, for example, in the media, how to solve this issue, or, or at least that they have realized we are facing this challenge. So this is something that the metrics uh, is not there, and it is not uh, no right and wrong metrics, but rather that, uh, sorry, uh, it seems that my video has stopped. Do you still hear me? We can hear you. That was okay. me. I, I, okay. I missed the right click by about two millimeters. I'm sorry, Tia. Okay, so that's all fine. So there's no right and wrong metrics, but uh, you are already there if uh, if you see that your message is uh, is carrying on. So that there are people who share and uh, uh, and realize uh, the view that uh, that we need to act on this because there are kind of the, the, the foresight shows that this is the point to intervene and, and rather sooner than later. So yeah, no right metrics, but you can of course uh, set some, uh, some uh, um, thresholds or milestones, for example, that um, let's see among the policy designers, um, these five key persons already realize that there is an issue and we have to act. So these kind of, uh, of uh, thresholds or, or milestones we've used uh, in our work. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no further questions, I think we can conclude here. Um, once again, a big thank you to all our panelists for the engaging uh, presentations, but also to our audience for um, the interest you've shown and for your presence. Thank you very much. Thank you also from my side. Um, I just want to flag before handing it um, over to Peter um, that uh, this was a really um, great experience. Thank you for the engagement of the audience, your many questions, your very keen interest to get the slides. Uh, I see there's a lot of um, interest to follow up on this work, potentially put this into practice um, in your uh, context. And as we've seen, uh, we really have people from all over the globe and um, spanning a lot of different hemispheres. Um, so it was it was wonderful to exchange with all of you. Um, and I want to put um, a special um, thanks out to, um, to, of course, our hosts from Flanders. Thank you so much for sharing the blueprint with everybody um, and giving the basis for uh, this discussion um, and also uh, being very active in getting further collaboration going and really um, investing into the network of foresight practitioners um, at, a, at a regional but just as much at a, at a national level. I just want to flag that um, us at the OECD, we're also working on a lot of these topics um, on our end. And in the fall, we will be publishing um, a first set of good principles for anticipatory innovation um, governance. Um, so stay tuned. Um, this will be shared in uh, our various networks. 
Um, and with that, um, allow me to hand it back over to Peter to conclude today's webinar. Thank you, Julia. It was a real pleasure to hear all these initiatives. I think that we that we demonstrated today that we have a vibrant community uh, of foresight practices all around the world. And, and that gives me hope in a sense that we know that society is changing um, and trends are kicking in as never as fast as before. But as a, um, as a governmental uh, foresight expert group, we have the ability to uh, work uh, with policymakers, bring the long-term in there so in the end that we create a more resilient society so that the future uh, is, a, is a nice place to be and that we start engaging already today um, to shape the future in a way that it serves our society. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you everybody for uh, contributing to the discussion, um, giving their insights, sharing their ideas. For us in Flanders, it always, um, it's always nice to to connect with uh, with other uh, with other people all around the world. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the seminar. And we hope to hear from you in the future. Bye for now. Bye bye. Have a good rest of the day. Bye for bye. now. Bye. Till bye.